Okay, hello and welcome to Star K's monthly kosher classes webinar. This class is held the last Wednesday of every month at noon. And um, we're here in the Star K offices in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I just want to check that you can hear us. If you're listening by via the web, if you can chat with us and let us know if you can hear us, that would be appreciated. Uh, my name is Rabbi Tzvi Goldberg, and I have joining me today Rabbi Moshe Shuchman. Good morning. Rabbi Shuchman was here with us uh, a little while ago speaking about the special uh, simonim that we eat on Rosh Hashanah, on the New Year. And uh, so here we, we have him back, we're very happy to have him back today to speak about the, today's topic. Uh, if you're calling in, or if you're having trouble with your computer and you want to call in, the number is 218 Eight nine five one two zero three two one eight eight nine five one two zero three passcode is twenty twenty pound and uh, today's today's topic is going to be uh, kosher cruising in light of the of the tragedy with the Costa Concordia ship. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. What happened over there? What's happening over there? Um, there, there is a, a cruise ship on its way near Italy that uh, struck a rock and uh, sunk. And uh, there were a number of people who were, who were killed, uh, still looking for some survivors. There are still some people missing. So it's really a terrible, terrible event. Uh, but it, 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 um, it's something that I think uh, maybe on some people's minds, how does this affect or should this affect the, the kosher cruising industry, and what are the, some relevant thoughts that we might have about it? We've been asked that, and I thought we might address that uh, today. So I guess it's a little more of a serious topic than sometimes we, we do discuss, but uh, I thought it was an interesting thing to talk, to talk about. Uh, the first thing I wanted to point out was there is a bracha of Hagomel, Hagomel Chayavim Tovos Shegmalani Koltov, Koltuv that uh, there is a blessing that we say, the rabbis instituted a blessing when a person is in a situation of danger and is safely uh, extricated from that danger, he says this, this blessing. Uh, one of the times that we, what are the, what are the four times? I don't mean to, to be a test by Rabbi Shuchman. There, there are four times that the rabbis instituted to say this, uh, right, if a person, this blessing. A person is traveling through a desert, if he's traveling through the sea, if he becomes ill and is uh, deathly ill, or if a person was in jail and was right. free, released from jail, released from jail, he makes the bracha of a gomel. Right. So, uh, so one of the times is when a person is going by sea, uh, and and therefore uh, one should make this blessing if one is on a boat that even if it lands safely, as most of them do, uh, one should make this blessing within three days after uh, disembarking from the boat. I think that most people probably. If I took a poll of people who would take cruises, probably it just slips their mind because they don't feel that they were in a dangerous situation. You don't get that feeling when you're on a boat. Uh, it goes from port to port and it's relatively calm most of the time. Most of the time. Uh, but yet, since the rabbis instituted this blessing, it remains so, even notwithstanding the safety uh, of, the, of the cruising. But this kind of event that happened uh, illustrates that it is not always safe, and when things go wrong, they can be very wrong, God forbid. So a person should not forget to make this blessing when he, uh, when he disembarks from the, from the boat. The other question I think that we need to discuss is, and if anybody wants to chat with us, feel free to, to do so. Uh, chat screen is on the left of your screen. And uh, we enjoy when people chat with us, and we try to uh, to deal with the with the issues that you want to speak about as well. So the second issue that I want to raise, Rabbi Shuchman, is uh, whether or not the safety of cruising is in question now. In other words, I mean this this is a terrible thing that happened, and so should he give one pause before he goes on a boat to say, well, you know. I don't know if this is really something I want to do. Yeah, I think the whole world is grappling with that question right now. It's not something, you know, it happened 100 years ago after the Titanic, and now it's 
coming up to people's minds. So I saw a news report where they interviewed some engineers, and the engineers claimed that these large, these extremely large shifts are still very stable and very safe from an engineering standpoint, but they're still subject to human error and poor judgment, and you know, things can go wrong. Right. So, uh, but from a from a so let's look at it from a, uh, a Torah angle. A uh, person is not allowed to put themselves in danger generally unless he has a good reason for doing so. Uh, so in the olden days, they were taking boats, and it was it was dangerous. But sometimes they had a, a very good reason, like they needed uh, they wanted to to move uh, from one country to the to, to the next, or for uh, they had to go overseas for for uh, for livelihood. That was very common. So that was that was one thing. But to go on a vacation where there's a danger involved, one would not really be allowed to, uh, to, to do that. Uh, but I, I don't know the percentages, but I, I, would, I would venture to say that, that the, the boats are really still very, very safe. I think so. And, and so therefore, if that's true, then we have a, a, a guideline of Shomer Pesayim Hashem. And the person, even if he goes into a situation where conceivably, maybe there might be some danger, he's allowed to do that if it's a far-fetched, no, normal people don't think about it, it's something that's done on an everyday basis. I think that would still apply to the, uh, to the boat. Do you agree? I would agree with that. I think so. I don't think it's different than going on an airplane or a train. Right, right. Now, there may be some other reasons why a person should not go on a, on a boat. Okay, we'll talk about okay. some of those. Yeah, but assuming that a person is otherwise... Uh, okay, uh, with uh, hal- halachically, from a standpoint of Jewish law, to go on a boat, then I don't think that the, that the fact that one in many boats had a problem would be a, a, a reason uh, for a person to not, not to go. Okay, so that's that we say, we're going to say it's not an issue. Uh, one of the things that is an issue, and I just want to bring this up right at the beginning, because to me this is perhaps the, the main issue, or the most important issue, is the issue of the, the lack of um, uh, modesty aboard the boats. Uh, these, some, many of these boats travel to uh, sunny destinations where the main event is the swimming and, and so on, and uh, people are walking around on the boat, uh, n- not dressed in, in, in a way, a fashion that's proper for, uh, for, for our uh, standards. And, uh, and that's something that a person sh- should give a person great pause before he considers to go. Now, one thing I'll tell you, I've spoken to people who have gone to, let's say, to boats to Alaska, mm-hmm. and they say that it's cold. And so it's really no different than being in a hotel somewhere, you know, where, where it's, you know, it may not be uh, the, uh, the type of dress people wear in a synagogue, but it's, um, you know, that's, that's the way, that's, you know, they, they feel that that's okay. Uh, so it sort of depends on where you're going. It also depends on who the person is. If a, if a woman, uh, let's say, two, two uh, uh, women would like to go on a boat as a, you know, to pass the time, for them, the modesty issue is not really that much of an issue. There could be an issue which type of shows they have and so on and so forth. But the modesty would be less of a problem for them. So it really depends on the person and where you're going. But it's something that can't be overlooked. I would hope that the people that arrange these kosher cruises they uh, took this into account, and it's something to ask when you signed up for a cruise to see well, what kind of accommodations. <laughs> I don't think that it's real. I don't know because but let, let's talk about okay. Most people saw the numbers of thousands of people who were on this boat. And this is typical. How many were there? Forty-two hundred. Forty-two hundred, including the staff. Passengers and crew is forty-two hundred. Four thousand people. That's like a small city. So uh, so when they have a kosher cruise, they're not getting you know a couple thousand. Uh, uh, kosher consumers to go on a cruise at one time. I'm sure they would love to do that, but it doesn't happen. So they, uh, they have perhaps uh, 300, 400, 500, I don't know exactly. Mm-hmm. And so that's out of the other couple thousand, and they can't control at all what the other, thousand or the other couple thousand are doing. It's, you know, they just take a, take a number of rooms, and they take a, um, uh, a, like a social hall is, is usable for them, for, for uh, for prayers, for the davening, for their events, mm. uh, but the rest of the boat is whatever it is. There was once somebody a few years ago who had an endeavor to create a completely kosher cruise. So he didn't take a boat that hold, 
holds 5,000 people. He took a boat that holds 400 people, a much smaller boat. And on that, he arranged for uh, every, everything was kosher. The entertainment was kosher, the food was kosher, the swimming was kosher, mm -hmm. meaning separate swimming. Uh, so that, that's something that, but it didn't, it didn't last. It's probably more fun on one, one of those large boats. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose they have more to do. All those amenities. Right, all right. So uh, that's something that I c we can't, uh, we, ha we must discuss that issue. We have to bring that up at, at right, right at the very beginning. Uh, somebody's asking over here, didn't this ship leave port on Erev Shabbos? And please explain the halach of traveling on Shabbos on a ship. Okay, that's, that's a good question. Did it leave on, on Friday? I don't know, but uh, Rabbi Goldberg, you're the author <laughs> authority on this question. Okay, so I, 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 do, I, I do have an article about this issue in our, on our website. Uh, if you go to our website, which is star-k.org, and you put into the, the search box cruise, then you will come up with this article. You won't come up with any of the Star K certified cruises because we don't uh, <laughs> we don't certify any any cruises. But you will come up with the article, and in the article, this is one of the things that we discuss: is is cruising with reference to Shabbos. What what the, what are the restrictions of Shabbos with reference to cruising? So, in a nutshell, um, one is not permitted to get onto a boat. It says in the Talmud, within three days of Shabbos. So that excludes uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. According to some opinions, uh, it only excludes Thursday, Friday, and Shabbos. So Wednesday is, a, is permitted according to some and forbidden according to the others. But the, the reason behind this, <clears throat> it's very interesting, is not given in the Talmud. What, what's the reason? So there are maybe ten opinions among the authorities why this would be forbidden. So we're not going to go through all ten now, okay. <laughs> but but uh, one of them is because of the, uh, the 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 fact that people get seasick when they're on a boat, and it takes a couple of days to get used to it. And if you're not used to it, then Shabbos, you'll not have very much uh, enjoyment on Shabbos. You'll be you'll be you'll be sick. A person would be sick. So this way, if you get on on, on the beginning of the week, by the time that that the end of the week comes around, you'll already be used to it. Does that happen on these? Major cruise ships? Do yeah, it, do, do it does season? happen. It does happen. Um, I have a quote from one of the uh, news outlets. Uh, here, on a particular boat called the Oasis, during every seven-day sailing, the, o the Oasis medical staff dispenses about 2,000 to 3,000 meclizine, a drug that treats seasickness, from the Wall Street Journal. Wow. And then in USA Today, we still hear plenty of reports from passengers who say they get seasick fairly regularly. Is that Oasis, Oasis of the Seas? That's the, that's the new boat that they built? The, is it? The, the largest ship in the world. Is it? Okay, I don't know. Sounds like it. I'm not familiar with, with it could be. So, uh, you know, two, two or 3,000 pills is a lot, it means a lot of people are coming, f maybe people are coming for more than one mm -hmm. uh, pill. And so a lot of people are getting seasick. A lot of people are not getting seasick. That's true. But this is this this, this is still is a concern nowadays, and for other uh, reasons I mentioned in the article, this concern still applies uh, nowadays. Um, and so, so therefore, if one wants to properly keep the, the Sabbath, uh, he would only board he or she would only board a boat that's leaving on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or perhaps on Wednesday. Okay. Um, now, if the boat leaves on so let's say Thursday or Friday, but docks for for Shabbos, that would be okay. But most of the boats aren't docking; they're continuing to uh, to to sail. So what happens if the boat departs from port on Sunday, but it comes to a stop on let's say Thursday, and then it wants to set sail again on Thursday? These boats they stop at various right. ports. Right. Okay, they stop at the along the, the way. Right, stop at the ports. So that's a good question. Is, is that considered like when they start up again on Thursday? It's a new trip. Um, I've discussed that with various authorities and um, and Rabbi Heinemann, who's our rabbinic uh, uh, administrator, and he feels that that's a continuation of the original trip. So as long as, as the trip started mm -hmm. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, then even though they stopped at the end of the week in the port, that's considered to be uh, the, the beginning of the trip. I mean, that's considered to be a continuation of what you started at the beginning of the week. You can go on the next leg of the journey, you even though it's within three days of Exactly. Exactly. So, um, 
you know, this is something that uh, people should be aware of and, and concerned about. And, um, you know, uh, look, this, this tragedy, this accident, uh, does bring to, to light that there is some danger involved. And if a person would like to protect themselves as much as possible from the danger, we know that, that it has to do mostly with the spiritual aspects of what a person does. How, what, what does he do spiritually to protect himself? So keeping the laws of the Sabbath and the laws of, of kosher and all the laws of modesty is going to be a, go a long way, a great zechus, a great merit in protecting him from all the, all the dangers. Okay, so that's, that's as far as going within uh, three days of Shabbos. There are, there are other issues also that have to do with, with Shabbos, with the Sabbath. Let's say a boat uh, docks on the Sabbath. So that brings up a whole another host of questions as well. Um, uh, one is, one is uh, if you get off the boat at that point, you're only allowed a certain amount of, of travel. Walking, travel, tchum. the tchum, because you we can't go outside the tchum, which is, um, you know, to three quarters of a mile or so. That's not so easy to judge the distance from the from the from the boat. Uh, so a person has to be careful with that. And then how will he get back on the boat? He needs his passport. He needs his ticket. Perhaps uh, he has to go through a metal detector, which may he may end up um, activating. So that's a problem uh, that a person has to keep in mind. It's not so, it wouldn't be, I wouldn't advise to get off a boat on, on the Sabbath because, because it, has, right. it has so many difficulties that involved. Um, as far as kosher it goes, uh, again, so you're dealing with a situation where you have uh, 4,000 people on the boat, 300 are eating kosher. Okay, now the boats have many, many kitchens to prepare. They don't just prepare it for so many people in one kitchen. They might have seven or eight kitchens. Uh, and, and they can spare very little for the kosher uh, cruisers because it's such a small percentage. So maybe they give them uh, a, a kitchen. If you're lucky, they would get a whole kitchen. So we're discussing a kosher cruise here, not, not what, a cruise. What, what they call a kosher cruise, right. what they advertise as a kosher cruise, which is, again, it it's means that you're going to be on a boat with mostly non-kosher mm -hmm. eater, eaters, and you're going to have a small percentage that are eating kosher. Right, so, so they give you not, they, but most of the time, from my understanding, they don't get a whole kitchen. They get part of a kitchen. Um, and it was, it was so, it comes down to it that one of these uh, supervisors, uh, a mashkiach, on one of these cruises, told me that he saw that they didn't even, on, on the cruise he was on, they didn't even get a whole table to prepare. That's a, that's a mashkiach's nightmare. They had half of a table that was divided in, in between with some uh, tin foil or divider. And he said that on one side they were preparing, I think they call it a pig and a poke or something to that effect, like a pig with an apple. <laughs> and on the other side they had their meals for, you know, the, the chicken mm -hmm. and meat that they had for, for the kosher eaters. And, you know, he was, he, it wasn't his job to tell them what to do. He was just overseeing according to the parameters that mm -hmm. were set up. But that's not something that most people would be comfortable with. No. So you want to check that out before you go. What kind of system do they have? And uh, is it a, well, an ideal situation or is it just, listen, we've got to do the best we can, so we'll make do? Hopefully you'll find something that has a reliable hechsher, you know. Right. Starkey doesn't certify it. Right. It's an interesting thing. The Starkey doesn't certify cruises. And as far as I know, the other major agencies don't either. I, I, I'm not aware, there might be, but I'm not aware of the major agencies certifying. Usually it's one of the local rabbis certifying. So you want to check into it uh, 100%. Um, I did a cruise on a big boat. I didn't sleep for four days. No door to lock up, a nightmare. Okay, this is uh, Yael Kanner. She's a mashki, one of our mashki chod, mm -hmm. uh, female ma uh, uh, kosher supervisors. A uh, very good one, I might add, and and uh, she did a cruise. She says, on a on a big boat, not for the Star K, because we didn't we didn't do it. But she said that she says she didn't sleep, because <laughs> there was no play, way to lock the the equipment uh, and the food up, and so how how you know somebody has to be on guard 24 hours a day. Not only that, but the the boats are so big. And maybe uh, Yael could tell us more about this, but my understanding is that, they do, that, that the storage 
is on different levels. So while you might have in a, in a restaurant, right, if they want to take the meat to serve to, to the kosher cons to consumers, they would go to the fridge, take out the meat, right, and cook it and put it down. But here, the, the, the place they're preparing the food is on the first level. But the, f the storage of the meat is on the sixth level. So they need to send a mashkiach up or somebody mm -hmm. up to go get it. And then the bread is on a different level. Everything is, is all over the place. And you need to track all that to make sure you're, it's coming back to the right uh, it's coming to the right uh, place. Wow. I think this boat, the Oasis, has 16 levels. 16 levels. 16 levels. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's something. Uh, it's something that is really uh, needs to be uh, thought about and addressed. What's that? It's just a rabbi. So. Okay. Um, here's another question: Are you allowed to carry on a boat? Is it a rishus haram? Okay. The question is: Are you allowed to carry on a boat on the Sabbath? Is it like an enclosed area, or is it more like the street, where in order to carry you need a special setup of an Eruv and so on, You're not, we don't carry in, in, uh, outside in the street? The answer is that it is not um, considered to be a Rishus Harabim. You're allowed, you would be allowed to carry on the boat. There may be something that a person needs to do called an Eruv Chatseros. Uh, that's a dispute between different uh, authorities. Uh, you know, I, I reference it in my article. That I would recommend that you ask your your rabbinic authority for a ruling on that. There are there are many who would be lenient and many who would who would not. So that's that's a matter of dispute. Um, okay, I want to I want to address some things, Rabbi Shuchman, that are particular to this uh, to this event that happened. One is I have here an article. From, uh, from one of the magazines, when can a, ca a cruise captain jump ship? So you know that this captain was allegedly uh, jumped or fell? Captain Satino. Right. He, 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 he fell off the boat, perhaps, or he jumped off. Uh, they alleged that he didn't want to get, get back on and help out. And I was thinking about what, what, what is from a, from a Jewish ethical perspective, mm -hmm. What is the job of a, of a captain or someone in that situation? I'll just read to you some of the, the quotes over here. Um, on every ship, one person is in charge. There is a prescribed hierarchy on all ships. He assumes command. Um, uh, captain Bill Wright, Senior Vice President of Marine Operations for Royal Caribbean, says that, that uh, the captain staying with the ship is an unwritten rule or law of the sea. Uh, it's, it, it's a matter of honor that the master is allowed to leave. Nothing less will do in this profession. So they definitely seem to be uh, 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 alleging that he did something wrong. Whether or not it's legally wrong or it's just morally wrong, uh, that's, I guess, up, you know, that's what they're going to argue out in court. Right. But let's discuss it from a, uh, from, uh, from a Jewish perspective. Um, what is his, what is his uh, job as a captain having taken this responsibility? So I know that you did some research on this. We talked about this before. Yeah, the, the Talmud has a case where there was a, a, a marauding army it came to Pompadisa, which is a city in Bavel, in Iraq. And the two leading rabbis, the Rosh Yeshiva of uh, Pompadisa, were Rabbah and Rav Yosef. And they fled the city. They were worried okay. for their lives. They ran mm -hmm. out. And Rabbi Zera, or Rav Zera, who was one of their colleagues, saw them fleeing for their lives. And he screamed to them, Arkoi, fleers, no, you can't be so cowardly, you can't leave the city. So the Hassan Sofer has an interpretation where Rav Zera was, was cr being critical of them, that they belong in the city to lead the city, to protect the city at the time of distress. Well, they retorted, that no, maybe they could help the 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 effort. They could help save the city mm -hmm. from the outside the city. They could pray for the on behalf of the people in the city. They could lead um, whatever context they could ha they could make to find people to save but the, the government city. contact the, the government, government context. Um, you know, and this has been going on through all the generations. You know, there's a story with the No de Yehuda when he was in Prague. So Prague was under siege in the mid 1700s, and he wanted to leave the city to because he feared for his own life. He wanted to get out of the city. And the Balabatan, the leaders of the community, they told him, you can't leave us at our time of distress, we need you here. And mm -hmm. that, that was, that's one way that the communities have acted in, in the past. The other, there's, in the, conversely, you find the Hafla, 
the Rebbe, the Chassam Sofer, was in uh, Frankfurt, and there's also at a time when Frankfurt was, un- was under fire, and there the community leaders told him, no, you should leave. You know, you, you, uh, why, why do you need to be here and be part of this danger? You're more valuable outside. Right, that's what the people told him. They that's wanted him to do. Him, right. right, so uh, th- that's interesting perspective. Um, I think we could think about this in two ways. One is, let's say he wasn't the captain, but he had ability to save in, by risking his life. He's just a passenger, but he can help other people escape. Um, so in that case, it's not 100% that he would be obligated to put himself at risk for other people. It's not, uh, you know, it depends how much risk there is for him. It depends how, much, how, how many people he could save. Uh, I don't think that we could fault him if he wanted to save himself. Right. Uh, well, that would be an, uh, an honorable thing to do to help others, but I, we couldn't fault him. But when he's the captain, and let's assume that this is one of his responsibilities. So he, he took the responsibility, we call it achrayas mm-hmm. in Hebrew, right? He took this responsibility, he took this job uh, as, uh, as a captain, knowing that this is the rule, this is what's expected of him. And, and, I mean, we don't only need a captain to, uh, you know, the boats mostly work on autopilot and he has other people helping him. You need a captain and a leader in a time of danger. That's right. what we need him for. So it certainly has to be implicit in the job that he's, if there's a problem, he's going to help. Uh, and, and so then, in that case, for him to, you know, jump off or you know, whatever way it is, you know, allegedly he's not, he's not helping, uh, from a Jewish perspective, it's very wrong. Because we're relying on you. You, have, you took a responsibility, and you, you have to take responsibilities very seriously. Um, he's facing 12 years in prison for abandoning the ship. Okay, that, that apparently is, is, then is a legal issue, not just an ethical issue. This question was especially a question during World War II, says Jerry. Sure, yeah. Some Rabbanim fled when Abel and Stump stayed with the people. And what about Rabbi Hanan Wasserman? He went back. He was in America at the time, right? And what happened? He went back to uh, be with his. He yeshiva. went back to be with his with with his people the, to. I think the Devar of Ram in Kovna, He went back, mm-hmm. but the opposite extreme, the Panovich Rav of uh, Shlom Yosef Kahaneman and Panovich, so he he escaped. It ignored at him, it bothered him for the rest of his life. Mm-hmm. Should he have stayed, should he not have stayed. Mm-hmm. But that's what motivated him to build a big Panovich Yeshiva in Bnei Brak because he had right. that that guilty feeling. Right. So it's. Um, I, I mean, I I. I I don't see any justification for him not uh, helping. Again, if he was just an, an individual uh, that wouldn't necessarily have taken upon himself this responsibility, then you know there's there, there is a lot of back and forth whether or not a person is obligated, probably not obligated to put himself at risk. There's a comment from the Chazanish. He says if a person feels he could save others, but his life is in danger, he does not have to leave. He's not obligated to leave, but if, if he feels he could, he wants to stay, he's permitted to stay and help others. Mm-hmm. Right. So, but we, right. He's not ob- right. We can't obligate a person to put himself in danger. But when, when that's when that's part of the job, a, a person is a uh, firefighter, right? So we he 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 he, he signed up for the job to be a firefighter, and then uh, at the very first uh, fire, the sign of danger, he runs away. Well, people people, we're relying on you. That's why we that's why we asked you to do this. You, I mean. You didn't have to do this, first of all. You knew it from the beginning. So you, you, you know that there is that there is this, an element of danger, and so for you to abscond at that minute is uh, wouldn't be acceptable from a from a uh, Torah perspective either. That's that's you know that's uh, that's the way I, I view it. Okay, I want to thank everybody for uh, for joining us, and uh, our our thoughts go out to those people that lost uh, mem- family members or friends on this boat and. Uh, maybe they still will find some, uh, even though it's been quite a while. Uh, if you have any questions about this or other topics, feel free to email us at info at star-k.org, info at star-k.org, or call us at 410-484-4110. Uh, again, the, the, we do have this article online at star-k.org, uh, an article about cruising, if you'd like to uh, take a look at it. I want to thank you very much, Rabbi Shuchman, for joining us here today. My pleasure. And, thank you for uh, having me. And thank you for your, for your, for your thoughts. Everyone have and a good Rosh Chodesh. Everybody should have a very safe, uh, a good month, a healthy month, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Take care.